so you've been doing uh, 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 cannabis treatments for 25 years? Or? 43, personally, for myself. 43 years ago, I was in a car accident. 44 years ago, I was in a car accident and um, had a brain trauma resultant of that accident. Many grand mal seizures, many a day, a plethora of medications, pharmaceuticals. And as is true of all epileptics, about 25% do not respond to the pharmaceuticals that are provided, still to this day. Uh, and I was one of those. So uh, my ex-husband, my, uh, uh, my husband at the time, Mike Corral, and the co-founder of Wham, found in a medical journal that cannabis was used successfully in treating laboratory-induced seizures in mice model. So quite interesting and desperate and had used cannabis before, of course, because growing up in the 60s, and, but not used it medically, not with that application in mind, and began to do so. And then my family members, my grandmother and my, um, my father, and then uh, did Mike's father family use it? Not really, but other probably cousins in his family, different mem members of our family, and people having cancer and other illnesses, with friends with AIDS, HIV AIDS, growing up in the Bay Area. We were able to use it and provide it for people, or that which we grew. And then we were arrested in 1992 the first time, became activists, mm -hmm. first patient in the state of California to employ the necessity defense, which dates back to the Magna Carta, wow. common law doctrine, which is good for everyone to know. Really? And, and so you actually uh, want it based on your intrinsic uh, intrinsic human right to... to... Uh, and then, yes, my, yes. So that if one, it's essentially this doctrine, that if one, you, one must satisfy six points of the doctrine, and if one commits a crime but does so to prevent a greater harm, then it's not a crime. Like stealing a boat to save a drowning person. Right. Every time you steal the boat to save the drowning, another drowning person, though, you have to reaffirm that defense. So. Uh, then we were arrested the next year again. We kept continued to grow, and then we were act pretty active and um, include began to open this collective and began to work with patients with many different people who were sick and who would outreach to us and had f formed our collective, which is based on a donation basis, uh, which in in the collective doctrine, I don't own Wham. Wham is, has a board of directors. It's collectively um, influenced, if, if not governed. It's a, club. It's a collective. Club. So a club, a club is more like a gym place where people go to work out or go to buy, buy cannabis. Wham is a different element because we have a different interest. It's more in healing, even right up to the moment of healing when you're dying. So it's a it's a grander, um, grander. It's a different model. Right. It's a model that uh, is much more fixed on phytotherapies, so plant medicines, uh, plant uh, and, and herbal applications, including a plethora of them. So all across the board, nature can heal us. You wouldn't want to eat poison oak, right? There, so we want a deeper understanding of how we not only live from nature, work with nature, build the soil, build the health of our external environment, and build the health of our internal environment, and the symbiosis of, as we work on our internal environment, of all of those uh, systems, our systems, how they work together, the things that we eat, the joy that we have, the consciousness the, with which we perceive, and uh, the medicines that we take, that everything we do heals us in some way. And our external environment and how we live in what conditions, under what conditions, and what is our environment and our microbiome and um, the biome that we live in. So to create a balance within the context of nature, not separate from nature. Um, and everyone, you know, these little whams, these similar models, across the world can work great. I mean, everybody designing it to work specifically from the root of their community. Right. So that's what makes, that's why the neighborhood store has the things in it that serves the neighborhood. 
because it knows what we want. It's directly influenced by our purchases or by our trade me mechanism. The trade mechanism in a big company is not the same. They give us quite different things. They give us these choices that break down after X amount of time that are sort of pre-governed and predetermined and pre-advertised and feed us more a concept of what we want which doesn't fulfill us and doesn't heal us. Is that totally true? No, because anything can heal. I mean, potentially. <laughs> we're, we're a mosh pit of, uh, of concept and the idea behind this sort of phytotherapeutic approach is that which nature provides and whatever else people want to bring into their healing. So people choose to do chemotherapies or other adjunctive types of therapy. That's still, of course, very important and, and you know, necessary for them to do. So um, uh, I noticed in, in, um, in your presentation, I really, really enjoyed it and I was, I was glad to, uh, you know, to, to listen to it. And I really like you. uh, your approach with a, with a holistic approach with cannabis as well as other things, just trying to give your body what it needs to, mm -hmm. to fight, right? So it's, it, it, it was, uh, so uh, how, how many people do you have in your organization right now? So about 1,500, but not all really active and not all people who are actively dying or healing or so. Right, we work with people right up to the moment of death and then after laying out their bodies and helping the family, and putting a safe, creating a safe space for viewing and, and reducing the costs around both palliative care, death itself, and then burial, cremation, those kinds of things. So the idea is that um, the people that we are serving around 750, maybe 800 or maybe closer to a thousand active-ish active members. So people are active to varying degrees, so they're not um, all using high dose or can, uh, THC rich extracts or CBD rich extracts. Um, we work with many children, many children with different disorders. For instance, we're looking deep, more deeply at seizure disorders that we can't really put our finger on what's causing it, which is often true with seizure disorder. Sometimes a person will have one seizure and never have any others. But there's maybe a quite significant leak, uh, link to, um, to the gut health and bacteria. And so we're leading people to uh, take their children to have these tests that can be run to determine different strains of bacteria. Everything the symbiosis with which our systems work. You know, you can't find, where's, where's the mind of a person, really? You know, how do we find one part? We're not separate parts. And uh, just like the plant is not separate parts, we can take out a heart and hold it and transplant it into another being. But it's the totality of being that's inseparable, that both heals and provides the opportunity for healing, for healing our environment. So would you say that um, you have, uh, I mean, what percentage of your people come to die and what percentage come to get healed? Well, everybody comes to live except for about a couple. A few people come in and say, look, I want to die and I want your help. Most people come with hope to live. Uh, with that said, we're approaching death. So as people are approaching death, we can, uh, well, you know, it's just setting the table for the appropriate course, right? So we just, we're there and we allow um, and encourage people to tell us what they need and then to be open for that, the opportunity to serve because it's really like, who do you serve? What do you serve, right? Who do you serve and what do you serve them? So you're there at the... Uh, Ushering, yeah. I've been at, um, I don't know, probably close, somewhere between 150 and 200 deaths. Many more assisting people, but not at the moment of death. 
somewhere around there. Have, have you seen people have like come back and have experiences and tell you what? To... But for small amount of time, very in interestingly, and this was in the early part of my work about twenty, maybe twenty three or years, twenty two or twenty three years ago, seeing people slip into that coma like state that precedes death, and um, <clears throat> applying using cannabis, um, applying it, doing it on an. <coughs> on an in-breath, so when they breathe in, you do a little shotgun, blow the smoke in, and people have, and this has occurred throughout time, but the first time I saw this was during that period, and folks have, have come back into this realm and um, cleaned, up, cleaned up things with other people, done, worked out, for whatever reason they came back or whatever it was that needed to be done and worked out conversationally or in the exchange with other people that they love. It's really a, you know, really remarkable. Um, I think that cannabis can be, certainly science is looking at that. That was 20, I spoke about that over 20 years ago. And I'm sure that neuroscientists are looking at that piece. How does it affect the brain that it may be able to suspend that coma-like state? Um, uh, and so it could be used in either way, perhaps. It could either create that suspension in the coma-like state, or one could move away from it and back into relieve that. And but but it doesn't like it's momentary because if if it's the thing that's happening, that's off you go. You know, it's it's the next great journey, right? Right. Maybe. Maybe. So, uh, Maybe. something just came to mind, I, I guess, you know, in that sense, cannabis can be a gateway drug. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right? truly. So, uh, the <laughs> the, the pearly gateway drug. The pearly gate, uh, that's a good one. The, <laughs> the pearly gateway drug. So, yeah, it could definitely be. But, you know, I, I, there are a few things that I, that I think, you know, to encourage. I hear many people saying, well, you know, it's better to have put a law through. At least people aren't going to jail this year. Um, we're, you know, we're, I, I hear that, and I, I don't. Of course, we want to re relieve suffering. But I'm not of the mind to create suffering by trying to relieve it. And I believe that's what's, it's what's, we have an opportunity to recreate an industry in whose name, right? So... So there's nothing in the most recent California law, as there isn't in any, that have been promoted by, this is promote, laws that are promoted by billionaires. These are not oh. grassroots laws. And, but there's grassroots element, except we lost these pieces. One, we lost the, the necessity to encourage or reward tithing or assistance for people who cannot access plant because of poverty. They can't access phytotherapies or medicines. And that's, that should be a given. It should be regulated if necessary to encourage care and to encourage sharing. Now, I can see why the rich don't want that. If, imagine the corporate state having to pay for the welfare of others. I mean, it's a brilliant idea and why not? But I can see why they would oppose it. And the second piece is, a, to put into place a law against genetic modification. Yeah, I abs absolutely, absolutely agree with, with that. And however, um, one thing that you've seen in, in California and Colorado is, is you see the prices of marijuana going like this. That's capitalism, that's competition. And that that's does not mean that people that are sick will be able to access it. That means recreationally food. speaking, it'll drive the price down. But people who are poor, People who become ill are often marginalized and often financially marginalized. And because of that, it's your rent, it's food, it's your children's paper to go to school. We owe it to the people upon whose backs we've built this, which is the medical community. That's who we said, we're doing it for, we're doing it for compassion. Okay, so let's do it for compassion, as well as for great wealth and power and greed and all the other things that come out of it, a little, just a morsel, just a, 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 grain, of, a grain of compassion will grow to serve 
everyone. It can. Ab it can. Ab absolutely, absolutely, for sure. I just saw something someone was writing about it um, recently. Uh, oh, that guy who, who was speaking about um, David about, about uh, going in uh, about the uh, nursing homes, mm. um, and uh, and he said, "Wouldn't it be, just be great if all those people could have cameras?" They used to in Santa Cruz. There was I dealt with a couple of the nursing homes and the administrators, and they let people do it. They had the smoke. There was a smoking area, so they let people go out and have pot smoking area. And then, as big business, they that's back in the day, decades ago, when they were privately owned. And as corporate interest came in and bought up all, you know, it's right. warehousing people. Right. They said no, no, we're not going to allow this to occur. So. That's unfortunate. Well, that's an idea. I mean, now it might be actually possible. Is is a is a private cannabis? That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. Where where it, 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 it I'm sure it'll happen. Many of the uh, principles that you use, and that's less uh, less drugs and more you know holistic and community kind of uh, approach, and, right? And a beautiful way to uh, right. to exit, maybe. Right. right. No, truly, truly. You know, all kinds of drugs, whatever people want to expand their consciousness whatever, and open their I mean, hearts. Yeah, like right. for example, uh, you know, DMT, psilocybin, right? I mean, if, if you're getting ready to go, you should kind of know where you're going and, you know, sort out your stuff here, so whatever. I mean, it's all right. part of it. All, Laura Huxley administered 200 milligrams of LSD on Aldous Huxley's deathbed. You know that story? No, I don't. Ah, it's a good story. I see, this timeless moment, Laura wrote of it in this timeless moment. It's a beautiful book of, of uh, the story of their lives and and Aldous's death. Really? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's lovely, and just the setting the stage for the mantra of creating peace and creating safe, peaceful space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's perfectly safe to die, right? I mean. Wasn't that Ramdas told me that? I think he, I think it was Emmanuel told Ramdas when he asked, "What should I tell people about dying?" And he said, "Oh, Ramdas, tell them it's perfectly safe." Uh -huh. Well, you know, with my that. own personal experience, I, I uh, did ayahuasca several times. And mm -hmm. What I noticed is, is the with some shamans in uh, Kiev, and I noticed my first experiences. I was really just dealing with things, you know, like. Mm -hmm. like it was, it was dealing with things, and then it was after a few times I, I was feeling better and everything, and, um, and and then I started to see beautiful things. It was kind of, like, and many people said that it's like the first steps you have to deal with the karma or whatever it is, and then you know you see the beautiful fractals and the you know, experience the love and everything, and and they do say that like DMT is really when you're born and when you die. Right? That's the death experience is, is the ayahuasca. So, you know, just an idea. Maybe prepare for that experience by experiencing it uh, before. Why not? Well, and that's, that's, what, um, that's what the esoterics say, that your preparation, you know, is in every breath and in your, in your practice. So the idea, whatever you, we use, it's our practice. It's our preparation. Even if we're doing a cruddy job of it, it's still our, our practice. You know, you kind of. It's. I think it's a good idea to to delve into it as much as we can. It's good, good practice to to pay attention, to be around people who are dying, and to be softer, and to recognize that we can um, contribute something by listening to what someone else wants on their journey, and don't take our expectations to somebody else's death. That's actually another Ramdas quote. It's quite brilliant. Don't take your expectations. Or to anybody else's anything. Right. Exactly. Right. Do you have you have a place or a clinic where people come? Um, we have a spot, and um, we have a big garden. I don't own I don't own my home anymore, so that happened, you know. And uh, I was I wasn't able to buy it out um, to buy my. Uh, ex-partner and ex-husband now, but things move on and so it opens up new possibilities for the potential of that Well, to I'd like to mention, uh, so uh, my brother, he's been growing uh, for 23 years in Sonoma County and he just, he 
he um, he went to Cal Poly, and he told a, a friend of his, um, he said, if you, there's some beautiful places in that area. And he said, if you find this kind of place, let's get it. And it was like five years, and, and his friend called him, and it, it's like, it has this amazingly clean artesian well. Mm. It's in this, uh, about five miles from the ocean, it's in this valley with these incredible oak trees. And he said, it's just like the most beautiful place. He said, when I saw it, I was, we're getting it. And they want to do just this. And so we're uh, one thing that we're doing is we're building uh, uh, houses from hemp. Nice. My partner, he just made, just built these beautiful stone houses, all from, all from hemp line uh, construction. It's just energetically, and the whole thing is it's incredible. And my brother has this land, and that's obviously not far from you, but it's a beautiful place, and he wants to... You know, just landscape it and make these little bungalows and whatever. So people just go there and, you know, get, mm. you, know, you know, no television. Yeah, you know, exactly. Um, exactly. It sounds organic, lovely. Big organic garden. And I would love to put you in pot. He's a beautiful person. That would be nice. Thank actually, you. He's actually been battling with uh, uh, Lyme's disease. And he found uh, mm, that's that, hard. That's that, a hard uh, one. that DMT and psilocybin, uh, it really helps him with. You know, it's interesting, and Ibogaine can do the same thing. It's interesting, I don't know the same thing, but it does these kinds of uh, phenomenal um, body shifts in health and awareness, health awareness. And so, yeah, I've noticed that with, uh, with some of the psychedelics. Quite, quite remarkable. In fact, um, in fact the, most, like, the most medicinal um, herbs are those which are psychedelic because obviously they react with our receptors, right? They have a they have an effect on Well, we don't know. Like, we might have made extinct some of the most incredible herb, herbs and plants that for which we have systems that we'll never even know. That's why we need to, in my, slow it, slow it down in our destruction and our dominion over nature. Right. Get a little more connected. And that's what so many of us are trying to do. That's what's so simpatico about this wonderful event, because there's so many people here doing the same thing, looking more, looking for something rich inside that longing that every person has and grabs and makes us thirsty fish and want to more, more, more is also the thing that is our deepest desire to become connected to what's profound and that, that deep path way inside the holy black stone of nothing, right? That, well, that's what I found with, uh, with hemp in general, with plants, um, is, is, and there's many aspects to it besides cannabinoids, there's the food, the fiber, oh, yeah. many, many different things, and that's what, what we're doing, but um, I, f I found that um, people, and starting with myself, but so many different people that have gotten into different aspects of this business, it's like you kind of find your call. You know, it's not for everyone, but, but when, when it's just all consuming, like I realized that that's all yeah. I do is have, you know, this, this is <laughs> my it. thing, you know. Well, and what's so great is that there's a way for you to do it, to bring your awareness, information gathering, turn that into knowledge, right, that, that jewel, and share it. It begets more. It's just amazing. It's, in, it's, it's uh, incredible. And I you've found a great, the two of you have found a great way to do this by bringing it in the form of the seed, you know, the seed of knowledge. Bringing information to people allows us to do whatever we want with it. So the kinds of information that we bring and the depth and the, the intention behind it is so profound. That's One thing which you said which, which, I, which I really liked was, was how you talked about uh, uh, how this opens uh, consciousness. And, um, and, I, and I was meeting with a, a lady in Colorado and she, she said something that kind of rang true to me, you know, when you hear things, and it's like, yeah, okay. I remember that. that. She said, she said, um, she said there's a spiritual virus, and, and, it's, and, and it keeps people kind of in the system, or it keeps them depressed, or whatever it does, and, 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 and something with, about cannabis actually, you know, it increases consciousness or opens that up. You know, or maybe it can, uh, yes. cures a, a spiritual vibe or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but we've seen that, in, uh, uh, and and I think like my yeah. personal, my nice. personal feeling is 
that um, like the, the structures and the um, the um, you know, world system the, the way it is is all is all kind of the foundation is people right and 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 people who are brainwashed to kind of support that system but the secret weapon which I see is happening is, is this amazing revolution that's happening in cannabis which is not like orchestrated controlled or organized it's just happening you know simultaneously around the world which gives me great hope that that we're going to see just some amazing transformation in, mm-hmm. you know, in, in people everywhere that's what i think mm-hmm. yeah it's beautiful i mean i i would agree i, I think that nature is finding the way to awaken in us a sensitivity that we've denied ourselves as we've become you know original sin is if you want is the way that we have fallen out of grace with nature we believe that we're separate so we are and that therein lie the the damaging piece and nature is reclaiming us as part of itself not only cannabis cannabis is hugely profoundly important role in it and it brings us deeper into the the web of all things the way that we're connected like the mycorrhizome in the earth yeah <laughs> the, the way right. that web there it is the web of all things of which we are just a very minute part and profoundly individual in the essence of the nature of who we are molecularly cellularly and that's the same of all things it's the sameness I, a bit vague and esoteric I, what I'm trying to say is that yes I agree with you I think that nature is reclaiming us and using many of the, the plant medicines and the wisdom that it contains to awaken us yeah, maybe that's another way that uh, cannabis is a, a gateway drug because because what I, I have noticed is is that it, quite interesting is, is that a lot of a lot of people are um, are vegetarians or more in, into natural living and food who are uh, uh, who are into cannabis and and I don't and so my question was okay is it that kind of people who get into cannabis or is it people who uh, experience cannabis who become more connected with uh, nature and I found with myself it, I just got more involved with cannabis and mm-hmm. it opened you know me to like I think being more in tune with nature with myself I think. yeah it's interesting yeah. isn't it yeah it's, and, I and it can be anyway right vegetarian I thought that was I mean I thought that, that was, was huge for you right yeah I was on ayahuasca actually and I saw this beautiful god or female kind of fractal entity that, and, and this amazing amount of this love that was like nectar you know she just said like you shouldn't eat meat you know just tell me you're not gonna do kind of like that I got that signal I'm like okay and that was nice. uh, that was uh, in March nice <laughs> so, nice yeah, yeah. and that's hard to everything like I can look back two and a half years ago when I when I got involved with hemp and, and cannabis um my whole life has changed, like everything, all the people around me, the, my family, my, you know, just, just, uh, just everything. And I've seen the same thing with everyone else who's gotten involved uh, around it, you know, it's, it's something magical. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's good, uh, it's good stuff, you know, and I, I really commend you for what you're doing and that you've been, you know, one of the, I mean, people that's really really kind of made this happen around the world, you know, the, the, the first people. I mean, you were, so, uh, wasn't it 95 that medical cannabis was in California? In 96, we were writing it in 95. We, we were doing, authoring it. A group of people. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. Our piece was the making sure that we could cultivate. Having your hands on your own plant, right. profoundly important. Don't, I say don't give up that piece of all the things. There are many things you have to ask for and not compromise. Um, you sh- it is very important what you compromise. It is very important because you don't get a chance later to go fix it. Trust that. You yeah, aren't going to yeah. get the corporations to give you more later. Never. They don't even give us a refrigerator that can last. Ridiculous. There's a 600-year-old clock ticking away every day, every moment, 
for, for 600 years without a problem. You can't yeah, make a tire, no. you know? Yeah. Anyway. No, it's all, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like that's, that. But actually, I, I spoke, <laughs> we could go off on that, and that's a well, whole I other sense of... I a friend of mine, and he said, yeah, I don't like, you know, it's all going to be corporatized. And it's not all going to be corporatized. And I said, no, I said, no, look at, like, the wine industry, right? It's, still, it's mostly like, that. It's mostly that, but you have, like, you have all these nice wineries that do very, you know, quality and, like, boutique. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be the same. All the, all the guys doing super high quality, you know, different strains, and what it, that'll be more desired. Like, for example, in, you know, in Barcelona, you can buy cheap weed all day long, as much as you want. But to, but the very expensive is like ten thousand a kilo. You can't find it. They'll be boutique, or, yeah. You know, it's They'll be boutique, and and but you know, if you think back on, look back at the history of, of alcohol prohibition, it was not small farmers and small growers and small bootleggers that it was Budweiser. Budweiser went in, bought just like Monsanto and many of the big corporate money and investors there going in and buying putting up their Budweiser signs and all the speakeasies and buying it. So they bought their position because money has always worked synonymously with power. The concept that we can do something different is what's profound here. That's what's profound. Not that we do the same thing that they did, make that money and get a piece of the billionaire. Look, billionaires are rich because they don't share their money. Let's face it. They keep it. So is that true of all billionaires? I don't know. I don't know any billionaires. But let's... Okay, Trump. But. No, but, but, so, but no, the but, point but, is that, that, that as we form this, we may look outside of the status quo. Why do we want to do that? Because does this really work well? Is this really profoundly effective when such a small percentage of the population of the planet owns most of the wealth? Is that really fair? It's not fair. And is it, is it balanced? No. And you know what's out of balance? We're taking her time. She's tired. It's Sunday. You've been you've been exquisite. Yeah, I mean, like, I have so much work to of do. course. No, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Of course I you just do. Want to share, Thank I, you. I'd like to share with you two things, right? So okay. Let's. So for you just say who you are. Really? Yes. I'm Valerie Leveroni Corral. I'm the director of WAM and the co-founder of WAM, and we're the longest. We're founded in 1993. One of the longest running medical marijuana organizations in. In North America, maybe you know, maybe the world. Long time, and we do a very unique um, sort of human services program. Okay, so Great. let's let's let her have her. I can pack up where you.